Hello, this is John with Theology It. All right. Uh, we're going to do part three of the questions about the Mark of the Beast series. Um, so this one's going to be a little bit different than the previous ones. The previous ones were more narrowing down um, the question of just what is the Mark of the Beast and understanding uh, what a physical Mark of the Beast would be like as, as opposed to a spiritual uh, Mark of the Beast. We're going to move away from that for now. Uh, that, that was more on the mark part. What does it mean to be a mark? Now we're going to be talking about the beast part, right? It's a mark of the beast. We can't really very well understand biblically the mark of the beast without knowing who the beast is, understanding the nature of the beast. Uh, and, and once you understand the nature of the beast, you got to understand what it means to worship the beast. You know, there are different theories about what it is to worship the beast. Some people talk about worshiping the beast like it's a, um, uh, a, a real religion. Like a, a one world religion comes in the uh, comes out and is revealed and replaces, you know, in, in many most parts of the world, Christianity or Islam or whatever else. And they have some elaborate story about how a one world religion is formed. And, and to take the mark of the beast, you're actually engaged in real worship of the beast in the sense of um, sort of traditional religious worship. Uh, the most egregious forms of idolatry, you know, like literally bowing down and, uh, and and esteeming some entity as God that is not God. And, but on the other hand, there's, you know, any Christian church that has even a basic understanding of idolatry, for example, would tell you that there are other ways to engage in worship in the sense that things, what you owe to God, you give to something else. And so you can worship money, you can worship uh, uh, other things that just don't deserve the uh, this place in your life. Material possessions, people, uh, reputation, a number of things, right? You can worship a lot of things. These are forms of idolatry. And so the question then becomes, what does it mean to worship the beast? Well, once we understand who the beast is a little better, or what the beast is, we can then look into what is Revelation, the book of Revelation, uh, referring to when it talks about worship, beast worship? And so we're going to look into these sorts of things. It's all sort of related. It comes together in here. Uh, so this, the question that I'm specifically going to be looking at today, and we're going to have to go through uh, quite a bit of scripture to understand it, but is what is the identity of the beast from the sea in Revelation 13? So Re Revelation 13 is two beasts, a beast from the sea, that's the first part of the chapter, and then a second beast uh, at the second half of the chapter comes out of the earth. Uh, we're going to focus on the first beast. That's what we're going to be looking at. But to get there, we need to start in Revelation chapter 12. This beast is in chapter 13, but Revelation 12 is going to give us our foundation. What happens in Revelation 12 and 13 is really interesting. Uh, you You actually have a movement. It's it, it's like um, a camera is, you know, I don't know. You haven't zoomed in yet. You just have sort of a normal frame. You look at it and you zoom in. So what you get in Revelation 12, it, at first, in the first uh, six verses, which are on your screen, uh, you have uh, sort of a wide lens or, you know, a wide view. And then you're going to zoom in on a part of it in the second half of Revelation 12, second part, and then in Revelation 13, the first beast is zo the, the third zoom, okay? Like if you were to focus on a very specific part of the story. And so we're going to get the same story told three times, <laughs> but with a little bit different emphasis and more details about different parts of this history uh, in these sections. So let's start with Revelation 12, 1 to, 1 to 6. Uh, I'll just read the passage. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail 
drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to god and to his throne and the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared by, of god that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days or sixty days okay so there's our our opening passage we have in this passage a beast okay uh in this case the beast is what the beast is a one of the, a wonder in heaven a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads now what we're looking at in this passage is has we 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 have a, in the theater of the theater of action is in heaven okay not not um the heaven of heavens, not the place where, you know, the deceased saints are and, and all of this. And we're not talking about that heaven at this point. Uh, the passage is situated in, you know, the, the heavens as far as like the sky, space, if you want to think of it that way. But, you know, it, it's it's in the sky. You're looking up the, the sphere, the area where you have the sun, the moon, the stars, okay? In that area, that's the theater of action. And that's important because some people get confused because there's going to be a war in heaven. Uh, and, and you see the dragon being cast out of heaven. And people switch in their minds to thinking that that's Satan and angels fighting in, you know, the heaven of heavens, you know, like where all the pure are and God is... You know, when we say God's everywhere, clearly, but um, when people think of God, like Christ at the right hand of God, there, that place. And that is not what's going on in Revelation. The theater of action is actually just heaven, sky, okay? Now, we have in here, we have the woman closed with the sun, you know, illuminated, and the moon under her feet. And upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. So here we can see what kind of heaven we're talking about, right? Um, the place where the sun, moon, and stars are. This woman represents the church. She represents the church. Um, and this is going to be interesting. We'll talk about the theaters of action of the book of Revelation here soon. When I say the theaters of action, we have things happening in the sea, like the beast coming out of the sea. We have another beast later that comes out of the earth. We have, again, wars and activity in heaven, a woman in heaven and a dragon in heaven. So we got heaven, so sky. We got earth, and we got sea and waters. Oops. And come on, screen. I don't know if you can tell, but... Okay, good. Uh, my screen disappeared. Maybe the recorder captured what was supposed to be there. But anyways, uh, what, what you have are these theaters of action in Revelation. And for us to understand Revelation, it does help to have an idea of what's going on with those theaters of action. They're not always very clear. Um, but, you know, we do the best we can, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But we have this going on in heaven, this elevated place where the elevated things are, the people, uh, in a sense, in in the high places like the church is supposed to be exalted holy and this dragon this dragon now we're going to look into that but the, the woman is representing the church and there is various reasons to believe that but here we see that she's pregnant giving birth travailing and all of that in birth and pain to be delivered and she's going to bring forth a child who will rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to god and to his throne, okay? Uh, the child is Christ. The dragon wants to devour the child as soon as it's born and all of that. Now, when we look here, uh, okay, some passages that show that the church is viewed in some respects as the mother of Christ, okay? Uh, here's an example in Galatians 4. Paul writing, he says, My little children of whom I... 
Okay, so here's an apostle of the church, right, uh, trying to bring forth something. Church authority, church leadership, trying to bring forth something. I travail in birth again until what? Christ be formed in you. So a representative of the church is trying to bring forth Christ like a birthing. So, so the it's Christ being brought forth by the woman is sort of an actual living out of the life of Christ or an understanding of Christ and a real grasping of true Christianity in the world. Okay, so as soon as this is being brought forth in the world, so I'm going to propose, and I'll explain this in, as we go, that we're looking at the at this point, uh, the early Christian church period when the church is bringing forth Christ. We're getting a history of redemption uh, in, the, in the Christian era in Revelation 12 to 13. And it's, it's very interesting. And we are going to have a focus on the end. So, you know, I'm not dismissing any reference to future events. I'm just saying that when we look at this passage, we're going to understand it and the beasts only if we actually grasp the history that has unfolded the last couple thousand years. Okay, but we'll get there. So what we have is this bringing forth of Christ by the church. The church here, or Paul, the representative of the church in this passage, uh, church leadership, is bringing forth Christ, trying to travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Now when you look at Matthew 3, we also see a case where um, Jesus is teaching uh, and his brethren and his mother show up, and they stand outside, you know, without, and they send unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. And he answering them, and he answered them, excuse me, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked round about on them which sat, on, sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. Again, so we're getting a, a picture of the church being, in a sense, the mother of Christ by doing the will of Christ, living out the life of Christ. Paul wanted to tra was travailing in birth so that people would actually do that. He wanted to bring about a church that lives like Christ and imitates Christ, does the will of God. Okay, and, and that was the goal. Uh, and so the church, being the mother of Christ in this respect, and it was in the early church bringing forth Christ. It's learning this. It was getting the teaching and all of that and was preparing to bring forth Christ, and the dragon was waiting to devour it. So what do we have in the early church? We have a lot of persecution. And as Christ Christology was being developed, the, uh, and, and people were understanding Christ, the church was, what was the big debate for the first few centuries? It was the nature and person, the natures and person of Christ. Is he God? Is he, you know, firstborn of all creation, just under God, but the greatest of all created things? Is he, uh, is he, is, are his natures mixed up? Is he like a hybrid God-man? Or does he have one nature as a human? Uh, fully human, and another nature is God, fully divine, distinct, and yet one person. How does it all work? And there's this whole, who is Christ? That was the real question. That was the main um, discussion, if you look at early church history. And so they were trying to bring forth Christ, to grasp him. And so this was going on in the early church. And while that was happening, the enemy was trying to attack and destroy persecute the church. And there's your dragon. Now, this dragon is described here. The dragon here is the enemy of the woman and her child, Christ. And when the church finally would bring forth Christ, this dragon would immediately try to devour him. Uh, and so regarding this dragon, we have a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. And uh, let's see, I'm looking, I'm skipping to, so the dragon, uh, and there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red, uh, great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. So now we look, and we get some hints here. 
from Revelation 17. So what are the seven heads and ten horns? And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains, the seven hills, on which the woman sitteth. Okay, uh, in Revelation 17, we'll talk with that. Uh, but that's where the, the whore of Babylon, the woman, sits on the back of the beast, the ten-horned beast and all that, uh, with seven heads. And so the woman is sitting on the back of this beast, and the beast here has seven heads, or which are seven hills or seven mountains. Uh, this is a clear reference in any reader, literally, I think, any reader that would have read this in the early church uh, when John wrote it would have been like, ah, the Rome. Easy, seven city of seven hills. Okay, so now we have our seven hills. Okay, so the seven hills of Rome. So the dragon has its heads representing Rome, and there are seven kings. Okay, so the, so the the seven the seven heads have a dual uh, meaning. They're they're sign, uh, signifying or representing the seven hills of Rome, a location, and also seven kings. Okay, or authorities. Now, this is an interesting uh, question, whether these seven kings are uh, individual persons, so actual kings, Nero, and so on, or are, you know, in the ancient church, some people, are, you, you can do modern as well. People would say, you know, maybe certain presidents or I don't know who they would say, UN leaders or whatever. Okay, so whoever these seven kings are, one one approach is to take this as individual persons. Okay. Another approach has been that it's not individual persons, an acceptable reading is also forms of government. And if you think of the beast as a political entity like like the a Roman Empire in the early church uh, period, so this, and that part of history. Uh, you know, in Daniel, we have the several beasts, the four beasts, and the fourth beast being the Roman Empire. And so, and that beast having, sharing a lot of the same characteristics. So if this beast is the Roman Empire, for example, the seven heads don't have to represent seven emperors or seven rulers of Rome, individual rulers. It could also rule uh, represent the seven ways the government was governed. Right? If the beast has heads, what do heads do? Heads sort of lead the organism, the, the, the uh, animal. That's what they do in us, right? You know, uh, that's our center of cognition and, and so on. And so the heads are just ways of guiding, directing, leading. They're the governors. They don't have to be individual kings. They can be ways of ruling. Okay? And, and that's, that's an allowable reading of the word for king. So people treating it as a form of government. This is a historical approach as well to understanding the book of uh, this, this, these heads. So this is not novel to me. I'm not like creating the seven forms of government uh, interpretation. It goes back a long way. Now, so we have seven heads representing seven hills of Rome and seven forms of government plausibly. You can take a different view and work on that, but I'm going to show you how I think about it. Um, and that's a, that's another thing just to add. This is this book, Revelation. We can't understand it. It wouldn't be in the Bible if it was impossible to understand. It's called a revelation. It, it has to reveal something, right? It has to be understandable. But that doesn't mean it's easy, or that anybody's getting every part of it right. Um, and so, you know, we're just doing the best we can. I think it's good to have a dialogue, a discussion, uh, and try to work on things uh, and understanding. But um, so we got seven hills of Rome represented, represented by the seven heads, and we have seven forms of government represented by the seven heads. And then we have our ten horns. What are those? This represents a plurality of kingdoms. So, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Now notice we have timing in this section. We have seven hills of Rome and seven forms of government. But look at the forms of government. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. John was writing this at a time. Those verbs have meaning. We have our, uh, our you know, the verb, with the, and one is, and the other is not yet come. We're getting a chronology here. Five came before John, 
One was in place when John was writing, and one will come after. Okay, so we have before, during, after. That means that this beast is a beast that exists when? Prior to John, while John is writing, and will continue after John, and John was writing at the time of the sixth head, whatever that is. Okay, so the sixth form of government in, I would say, the Roman Empire. And so we get, a, we get a timing. Whatever interpretation we provide of the beast and these seven heads, we should be looking at a time that applies at least on one reading, on one, one, I'll call it a layer of meaning, one reading or layer of meaning of this passage. Some people, but, eh, I'll, I'll talk about that later. But, but on one reading, you have to take a primary or a, 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 an interpretation of this book that looks at it as having some application that is in John's time, because that's what you would read. If you read that, you picked up this letter after John wrote it, he hands it out, you know, he distributes it, and, and now you read it. And you say, okay, five were fallen, one is, and one's coming. You say, well, who is? And you're going to look right there in your life. And you're going to say, well, who are the five that were before? And you're going to look back in history at that point. Okay, so you have to have a reading that situates it at the time, which strengthens, again, the case that it's the Roman Empire and all at that time. Uh, we're going to talk about the ten horns here. The ten horns come after the, se the seventh form of government of Rome. In other words, after the fall of Rome, you end up getting the rising of a plurality of kingdoms. What came in the place of Rome? The Roman Empire falls, and then you just get a mess of countries or kingdoms duchies and, you know, archates and exarchates and all this stuff. I mean, I don't even, it's a complicated mess that was in Europe after that. And so you, you, you get this, you know, these new series of kingdoms. Now, some people like Isaac Newton actually tried to identify the 10. It's calling it exactly 10. Uh, I think it's plausible as well to read 10 is just a number of completion, you know, just a lot of them, and it's all of them. The ones that came after it in the place of Rome that share the identity of Rome, sort of cultural identity, uh, the influence historically of Rome shapes their governments, how they operate, their law, uh, things like that. And so you get this sort of Roman, post-Roman way of being. And there's lots of little places and countries that have some sort of affiliation with one another, but they never can really become truly one because they're separate kingdoms. Uh, I think that's the idea, more or less. Uh, but you get this after the fall of the Roman Empire. And so you have a, a kingdom situated in the seven hills of Rome. So Rome, ten, uh, seven forms of government, and that will be replaced by a continuation culturally of what was before in the Roman Empire, but really a divided mess of countries. Uh, in Daniel, the toes are a mix of materials. There are 10 toes, but then there are also mixed up different materials, some strong, some weak, right? And so you, you get this idea of just sort of a mess. Okay. Uh, so let's keep going. We have this dragon we'll keep talking about. What are the seven forms of government? Just to give you an idea of what they would be. Uh, in Rome, you had seven forms of government historically at the time that John wrote the book of Revelation. Pagan emperors were in power. I, I put, well, okay. And so you have kings, consuls, uh, depends on how you pronounce that, uh, decemvirs or decemvirs or decemviri. Uh, so you have, you know, the, the a rule by dec, 10, like a decade or uh, December, or, which December actually is, even though it's the 12th month of the year, the, the root comes from 10. Um, you have the triumvirs, uh, ruled by three, and then you have these emperors, okay? And then you have a major transformation of the empire in uh, Christian numbers. But, I, you know, let me, yeah, we'll talk about that. I'm not sure. I wrote this slide. I'm not sure when I actually go with that. Let's see. So I'll, I'll explain this. Let's go. Uh, you know, when you're working through interpretation of stuff like this, it, it is, eh, it's a work in progress. You're trying to understand things and come up with the best explanation. Um, 
well, let me just show you. So we have our kings in the history of the Roman government. You have the Roman kingdom, that's where it started. You have these seven kings. Then you move to consul, the consuls in the Roman Republic. Uh, then throughout the Repo Roman Republic, you have times uh, where you had a you know, rule by 10. Uh, the first one being around 450-ish uh, BC. Uh, you had as well, throughout this whole period, during periods of emergency, uh, when you needed fast decision-making and so on, you had a rule by dictators, uh, and they would come in and be temporary dictators. In, in a sense, that's actually what Ro uh, the, the U.S. was supposed to be doing when, during periods of war, uh, when you had uh, presidents having this right to make executive orders. Uh, so they could act unilaterally more quickly and so on. So you, you had dictators in Rome, okay? But they were not all the time. This isn't like a continuous line of dictators. The point is, occasionally throughout this whole period, you would have cause for dictators and you'd get one. Um, and so here's an example. In the same period, there was a period uh, in, from 60 to 53 BC when you had a triumvirate, Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. Okay, and so you had uh, a rule by three. That was the first of those. Uh, and then you had, ah, here, this is what I actually think is the correct division. When I saw that, I was like, why did I, why did I not edit that? Okay, so I'll edit that in just a second for you guys. But you have the uh, a single emperor. Okay, uh, so we move from the Roman Republic to the empire here. And so you get the... A single, a single emperor or a principate. Principate, principate, principate. Depends how you pronounce it. When you translate from one language to another or transliterate, uh, sometimes it's, it gets tricky how you pronounce it. Uh, and then you have the tetrarchy. So there was a, a period when you had rule by four, um, when the Roman Empire split le uh, Western, Eastern, and then the way the power was divided up. And you had these sort of divided rule uh, that was temporary at this point and went back to single emperors. Um, and then later, with the division of the Roman Empire totally, uh, and breakup of the Western Roman Empire, you, you still have the Byzantine Empire afterwards. But uh, that's not important. The point being, you have the single emperors, and then you have a tetrarchy. And so you can replace this. Now, we'll talk about the other one in a minute. Because you, you, you have in the passage in Revelation 17 where it talks about these heads, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet coming. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not even, he is the eighth, and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Okay, we'll try to get to that. Um, but for now, we have our seven forms of government. Now, let's keep going. Notice that we have this dragon in Revelation 12. Where are the seven crowns? Or where are the crowns? The crowns are on the seven heads. The authority is in Rome. And this is a strong evidence, uh, in my opinion, that we're looking at the early church here. The, we have a clear reference to Rome. We have a clear reference to a power that was in power, the sixth head of government, former government, when John was writing. So it, it, it was... Uh, it's an ancient power, an ancient beast, if you want to call it that at the point. And the crowns are in Rome. So we are still looking at a real Roman Empire with the authority seated in the city with, of Seven Hills. Now, that is interesting because that's going to change. The seven crowns on the heads are in Revelation thirteen or 12 on the dragon, seven crowns upon his heads. But if you look in Revelation 13, we'll talk about that in a second, but in Revelation 13, oh, I'll get there. Well, I'm not going to get there fast. In Revelation 13, I'll just tell you, and we'll see it in a second. Uh, in Revelation 13, the crowns are on the horns. So we have 10 crowns on the 10 horns. And so we have a shift in the location of power. So John was talking about in the future, you're going to have these horns. But right now, we're on the sixth head of the beast. 
In other words, right now, at the time John's writing, the power is still on these heads, the seven heads, and actually on the sixth one, specifically at the time John was writing, in Rome. That's where the, he wasn't writing in Rome, <laughs> that's where the power was. Now, when the crowns are moved to the horns, these are the horns that at the time of John had not received power or kingdom as yet. That he was then moving forward. So in Revelation 13, the beast that he's looking at is a beast that's future relative to John, the apostle. So it's going to be in the future uh, from his perspective. And so we are going to be looking for the identity of that beast uh, where it comes in after the early church at some point. Now, or at least after the Apostle John wrote the, wrote the book of Revelation. So let's go ahead and keep digging in here. Uh, and so, yeah, oh, look, I have the slide right here, Revelation 13. Because in Revelation 13, it shifts to the horns. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns. Now, one way you can possibly look at this is that the, div the division into ten is sort of like the rule of ten in the Roman Empire. One of the heads of Rome was the decemvirs, okay, the rule of ten. And so here, when the power is switched over to this divided Roman beast, this beast after the divided Roman Empire, you get the power seated in ten places. And that sounds very similar to the head that would have been the ten, rule of ten in, in Rome. And so perhaps the power that resurrected long after it was dead is the rule of ten. Uh, that's, you know, you have the dead head that hit one wounded in the head and rises or returns. Uh, here, this could be it. But either way, let's keep going. All right, so we have this description. This shows us that the dragon represents the Roman Empire. Uh, it's Satan, so the, it's good, right, because we're going to see that explicitly. Um, but that means there's a relationship understood by John that the Roman Empire is profoundly influenced, inspired by uh, Satan, is satanic. This is the pagan Roman Empire that was a persecuting power, an aggressive persecuting power in many periods of time, um, and hostile to the church and uh, under several emperors. Uh, and so you can understand why he would call it satanic. Okay. But this shows us that the dragon represents the Roman Empire, the one that was present at the time of John uh, and prior to, uh, at the time John wrote the book, prior to its demise and replacement by the plurality of kingdoms or countries that arose in its place. So there you have this identity of this uh, dragon. So let's keep going. Now, the first part, let me go ahead and back. I need to backtrack a bit. One slide away. I have to remember that. So we're looking at this passage. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. So you get this sort of reference to the apostles. Now, as an aside, I'm going to make this uh, comment. Uh, stars, because we're talking about what? Something in the theater of heaven. And it is the church, this woman, clothed in the sun. You know, so the light of Christ, and with the moon under her feet, we can offer interpretations of that. Right? There's different uh, approaches people take. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars. In Revelation 1, uh, stars are, refer are, are quote unquote, angels. Okay, uh, let me pull that up fast. So we appear. Uh, verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, the word angels here is angelos in, in Greek, and it just means messenger. Uh, if you hear for people who want to see that strong, right? So often in the history of the church, the... Uh, Christians interpreted this not as angels, as though John was, you know, told to give letters to spiritual beings, um, you know, so, uh, but that he these are the ministers, so the the leadership of the church, pastors. So and he saw the messengers, the preachers. So here, angels, you can see in this angelo, uh, and it is a messenger 
especially an angel, by implication, a pastor. So it, it's translated angels because that's where you get the word. It comes from angelos, so you can hear the sound of it, right? And, and so we call them angels. But in this case, you're looking at a messenger or a pastor. And so you have the pastors of the church, which makes a lot more sense. You know, in chapters 2 and 3, and under the angel of the church of Ephesus, right? These things, say, if he, you're supposed to write to angels, right? What, what, did the, what did the apostles do when they wrote letters? They sent them to churches to have the church read them to the people. That's going to pastors. It's not going to, you know, Gabriel and Michael, the archangels or somebody who are supposed to, like, show up there. You know, it, it, and so these angels are representing leadership in the church. So when you go back here and we see the 12 stars, you're looking at leadership, clearly the 12 apostles, because you're looking at the Christian church now going into the Christian era with the apostles being uh, sort of crown jewels in the Christian church. All right, uh, and she being with child, again, we talked about that being bringing forth Christ in the early church, uh, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered, trying to bring forth this man-child who would rule the nations uh, with a rod of iron. Okay. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, uh, and behold, a great red dragon talked about, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and to cast them into the earth through persecution and so on. He's going to be destroying the church, leading pastors out of the uh, fold. Satan is going to deceive church leaders. You're going to get false faith, uh, heresy, Christology being attacked, right? All sorts of things. Um, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. We'll talk about that period of time repeatedly in this video, but I'm not going to actually talk about what it means or when it is until probably the next video. But um, here, so here we get the woman fleeing. So in our first big, our first snapshot of this, of church history, what do we get? It focuses on the early church primarily. We get the dragon with power still on the seven heads in Rome. The church still in labor trying to bring forth Christ at the beginning. It's like a new thing. Finally brings forth Christ. Rome, Satan through Rome, is attacking the church, persecuting, damaging church leadership, influencing uh, leadership in the church and pastors, bringing them down to earth, okay, through heresies. And they're getting this influence uh, in this period of time. And she brings forth the child, finally. And you, you, you have the church having to flee because of persecution after that. Uh, because it's not safe. And that's going to be for 1,260 uh, days here. Now, that is uh, really interesting because we're getting a picture of church history, but it moved really fast <laughs> in this last part. We, we have an emphasis on the early church, then it moves fast. But we're going to get a close-up of the middle section here in chapter 12, the next part. Let me find where that is. Okay, yeah. Satan thrown down to earth. Revelation 12, 7 and following. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. So here we're seeing the dragon being cast out. Now we're getting, in a sense, the fall of the Roman Empire. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of his brethren is cast 
down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his wa mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see the seed? The seed is, is what the woman brings forth, right? And what is it? The people of God, the church again. So it's like Christians acting like Christ, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, okay, so now let's dig in. So the dragon is cast out. So now we're going to be looking with a little more focus on what happens in the lead up to this 1,260 days to the woman and this transition of the dragon from the dragon, Rome, or emphasis on, on Satan-inspired Roman Empire in ancient history, to the ten horns. Because what? He gets cast out of heaven, and where does he go? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath. Where does our beast in Revelation 13 come from? We, we always say, call him what? The beast that comes from the sea. See? He went down to the sea. He was thrown out of heaven to the earth and the sea, and he's going to have to come back up in a new form, right out of the sea. So what we're watching is a transition from the seven crowned heads of the beast, the fall of that beast, the Roman Empire, the dragon, okay, Satan operating through them. Satan then, being separated from the Roman Empire in a sense, and going down the sea is going to bring up out of the sea the ten horns, the ten-horned empire, where the crowns are on the horns in Revelation 13. And, and so we're going to watch this transition, and what we're looking at in the second part is the same history, because we're going from uh, a snapshot in the first part that looked at ancient history, moved quickly, to this middle period of the fall of the Roman Empire into the rise of the post-Roman Empire, the divided kingdoms. Now, when you look here, it's interesting, this division happens when? The fall of the Roman Empire and then the rise of these, what will be implied, when you know, woe unto you that are down there in the earth, and the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. That happens be before the woman has to flee for a time and times and half a time. That's the 1,260 days of time being a year, 360 days, they did lunar years, uh, times being two years, 720 days, and then a half a time being 180 days. And when you sum that up, you get your 1,260 days. And so what you get here is the same period of time. But we see now that that same period of time actually comes after the fall of the Roman Empire when Satan has inhabited uh, this other beast, the Ten Horns. Okay, so now let's take a little bit of a closer look here. So the dragon is satanic, cast out of heaven. We're going to keep looking at the dragon here. I tried to depict this a little bit. Your, your theaters of action, you have the earth. Um, you have the waters. The waters represent the peoples, right? And he saith unto me, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes of nations and tongues. And, you know, Isaiah. Uh, but the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. After the Roman Empire falls, Satan is thrown down. Woe unto you, inhabitants of the earth and the sea. And then a beast comes out of the sea. Satan is down there. What happens? 
there's inhab first off there's inhabitants of the sea woe to you inhabitants of the sea <laughs> you know you 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 masses of people who are the sea satan's come down to you and he goes down and out of the the mess that was going on after the fall of the roman empire lots of different peoples coming in invaders and okay you 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 have what out of that mess rising a new beast out of the sea rises a new beast out of the mess of wicked confused troubled humanity after the fall of the roman empire which caused enormous chaos comes a new system and satan is influencing the whole thing this is shaped uh informed by satanic influence and so the the various kingdoms the crowns of the ten horns are are representing Satan occupying this power, coming out of the mess of people after the fall of the Roman Empire and bringing forth this new uh, system, which is really a disorganized system, 10 different kingdoms uh, or a completion of, you know, a plurality of them. Okay, so he's cast out of heaven, the high up, high up place here, and the, this uh, exalted place related to the church, uh, his influence in the church being great, he is thrown down uh, to the earth and the sea, and he brings up a new beast out of the sea, which is the masses of peoples. Now, the satanic spirit of the Roman Empire with the fall of the exempted, exempt, uh, exalted empire uh, being in heaven was thrown down to the earth and the sea. We just talked about that. And the dragon drives the woman into the wilderness for a time and times and a half of time. That's the 1,260 days, and he's a persecutor. Okay, so um, let's keep moving. So you can see the parallels here in Revelation 12.4. This is our first snapshot in a sense of the period of his church history and his tail drew the third part of the stars through drew the third part of the stars of heaven and he cast them down to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which is ready to be devoured or delivered excuse me for to devour her child as soon as it was born we see that also repeated in a different way with more detail in revelation 12 7 through 9 and there was a war in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not neither was there found any more and neither was their place found anymore in heaven, and he was cast out. Okay. So, second, you get, and she brought forth a man child in verse 5, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Revelation 12 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. So now we have the man child already brought forth, and he's going to persecute. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there for 1,203 score days, or 1,260 days. And here we get it again in 1214. And the woman, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, eagle uh, that she might fly into the wilderness. Here's your fling. Into her place, there's the place, where she is nourished, prepared of God that they should feed her uh, for 1,260 days. For 1,260 days. And so you get a parallel. I mean, this is clearly repeating uh, what's going on. We're moving from the early church to actually seeing the fall and what's going to happen. How uh, the, the key here to understanding the beast that rises out of the sea is we're going to see that the beast comes from the dragon in a sense, right? The Roman beast is thrown down. Satan uh, is now sort of without an empire he's occupying, goes into the masses of the people and brings forth a new system. And the new system he brings forth is the political power that comes in these divided kingdoms uh, that came from the Roman Empire. Um, some strong, some weak, some, you know, this mess. He brings that up. That's Satan occupying, in a sense, a new form of government that he's going to use as a persecuting power uh, to make it hard for the genuine Christians. All right, so now we can move to our beast in Revelation 13. We're now finally, 49 minutes in, it looks like, uh, going to be talking about the beast that comes from the sea. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy 
heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast, which I saw, was like unto a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemy, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Notice the dwelling in heaven on earth, right? So again, theater of heaven, the church, the Christians are up there in heaven. Uh, he's down here on the earth and the sea. Okay, I'm going to keep going. So we're getting our theaters of action. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Them that dwell in heaven. Okay? And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Okay, so there is our passage about the beast from the sea. Now, we've already made a lot of progress on who the beast from the sea is by looking at Revelation 12. We, we, started this, we, we know where we're at in history now. We're at the power of divided kingdoms that come after the fall of the Roman Empire. When Satan was cast, separated, cast down from heaven, in a sense, when the empire was destroyed, he had to go get something else. And what he did is he brought out of the, the mess of peoples, the wicked are like the troubled sea. He brought out of the sea, what? this divided set of kingdoms, these post-Roman kingdoms and powers and nations that have Roman identity, Roman history, Roman influence, and so on. So let's keep going. Oh, look. So the beast comes after the sea, after the Roman Empire falls, and Satan disturbs the seer people. Okay. And we've talked about that. The beast has many of the same characteristics as the dragon, so we're getting the identity, right? The crowns are now on his horns. So just like the dragon had seven heads and ten horns, the beast from the sea does. Uh, but this time we have them changing where the power is, from crowns on heads to crowns on uh, horns. The beast shares characteristics from the uh, prior four beasts. Okay, you have four beasts that went before this beast, uh, the divided kingdoms. You have the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian, the Hellenistic, and the Roman in Daniel. Uh, now those beasts were share these characteristics. Here we see in Revelation 13, 2, this beast is like a leopard, bear, lion, dragon. And when we look at Daniel, we have the first beast, being Babylonian, like a lion. The second beast, uh, the Medo-Persian, like a bear. We have the Hellenistic represented as a leopard. Here's your leopard. And then the fourth beast, which, which represented the Roman Empire in Daniel, was a beast with ten horns. And in Daniel is called what? The dragon. And there it is. Okay? So we have the four beasts. I'm sorry, in Daniel, in Revelation 12, it's called dragon. And so we, we get this fourth beast as a dragon in Revelation 12. So brought in here to be described as a dragon. So we get the characteristics. It's like you get all the worst if you get the worst that you had in all these different empires, godless pagan empires, uh, showing up in this new mess of countries. One head wounded and healed. So we have, and I saw one of the heads wounded to death, and his deadly wound healed, and all the world wandered, wandered, wandered after the beast. Wandered. Yeah. Wandered. So they're amazed by him. And so we have the uh, one head wounded and healed. I think probably the head's representing types of power. And now this beast being described with crowns and the ten horns being all divided up like a mess. I think what we're looking at is a period of time 
when you have a, a loose identity or loose affiliation of various nations that have sort of Western uh, influence of Rome in, in the West. So, I mean, even today we have like NATO, right? Which is, a they're, they're, they're sort of linked together, but they're all broken up still, uh, these various nations. And they, and they, I still have, feel the influence of the Roman Empire shaping their politics, shaping their law, their systems of government, and so on. Uh, and so we, we have that. Uh, and so my guess is that that's the, the uh, Decembers or Decembers. Okay. Uh, the dragon gives him his authority, and those who give power to the beast are implicitly worshiping the dragon. Now, here we have the dragon is, remember, Satan. We get that in, in Revelation 12. It's representing the Roman Empire when the crowns are on his seven heads. But when that's not the case, when those crowns are gone, the dragon still is Satan. They were thinking of the Roman Empire a lot like, I guess, you hear some of the uh, uh, people in the Middle East calling the United States the great Satan, right? I, you're looking at the Roman Empire like Satan at that time, just trying actively to put down the rise of Christianity in the world right as it's starting. <laughs> um, and so the dragon was... It is Satan, but when the when the power was taken from him, and he didn't have the crowns in the in Rome anymore, the seven hills, uh, he goes and he brings up something else. The dragon is Satan functioning. So here we have, um, and the dragon gave him his power and a seat and great authority, and they worshipped the dragon, Satan, who gave power unto the beast, the people that give power to the beast, these governments, okay, this unified. Attempt to sort of unify this, this loosely unified uh, different countries. Okay, so maybe the Holy Roman Empire for a while, then you have NATO and things like that. Now you, you've always had this attempt to keep everybody sort of together uh, in Europe and EU, right? So you have and the and they worship the dragon who gave power to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, "Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him?" This is something that's interesting. When people ask, "What's the nature of the worship? Is it a religion?" No, these are countries, and look what the, look how it's described. Who worships Satan? The people who give power to the beast. How are they worshiping the beast and giving power to him? Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? It's like they're patriotic. Nobody's like our country. Nobody is as great as the Western powers. These are these are you know flag flyers people who admire and love and think it's great, you know, America, Europe, this is, that's the place to be, the greatest countries, the first world, beautiful, wonderful places, and we love them, and we support them, and, you know, nobody's going to bring them down. They're the, you know, what is it? You have all sorts of metaphors and ways of describing it that are, you know, supposed to sort of praise and exalt it, you know. Um, that is a form of worshiping the beast. The beast worshipers are people that keep the system propped up and just can't believe that it's bad. Right? Uh, and, and they just, they won't resist in a sense, right? Who's able to make war with them? We're not going to take away power from them or try to diminish his power. Who's going to fight back? Okay, let's keep going. Beast worship is a form of patriotism uh, or exaggeration of the beast's power. Okay, uh, and there was given unto him a mouth. So this beast comes up, and after he's there, he gets a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and power was given unto him to continue this is 42 months. Now it's another way of doing, uh, getting our 1,260 days. So we have the 1,260 days again. So we get the lead up and ultimately the focus on the 1,260 days. So we look at the two snapshots in Revelation 12. One is focusing on the early church and the division, uh, early church period, Roman Empire with the early church. Second picture is fall of the Roman Empire into the mess and the, de the, the Satan going into the, you know, inhabiting or 
being with the inhabitants of the sea and the earth, and woe unto them. And then finally, we get the third picture, which is the beast that rises up out of the sea. That's when Satan actually is going to come up out of the sea after being cast down. And now we get a new um, period that we're focusing on, and it's mostly this 1,260 days. When this beast rises up with the ten horns. Okay, so these are the kingdoms that come up after the fall of the Roman Empire, and then they're going to become more and more blasphemous, and you're going to have a period of 1,260 years of blasphemy. And it's going to be related to a key part of this divided kingdom is going to be in with the second beast, and we'll talk about that. But the second beast comes up out of the earth, which is like a way of representing coming up out of this beast in a sense. And remember, Daniel, you had ten, the ten horns, and then you had a little horn. One reason you can believe or think that the ten horns aren't literally ten is when that little horn comes up, it plucks up three horns. But you still have the ten horns, right? You can subtract three and still get ten. Ten minus three doesn't equal ten. Um, it just means the complete number. Like it's just a large number of, divided king, uh, of kingdoms. But what you end up with is the little horn comes up. And that's the one that speaks great blasphemies in Daniel. And it's there for 1,260 days. Um, and I'll talk about that in future video. Uh, but the point is, I, out of this, you're going to get a period that's going to be defined as 1,260 days uh, more by that movement when the blasphemy begins. Okay. So... Uh, this exa uh, ex you know, exaggerated form of blasphemy. And so here's your 42 months again, and so now you, you get this comparison, right? So you get 1260 days, 1260 days, and first snapshot, first part of 12, right, chapter 12, second part of chapter 12, and of course we just saw it in 13. Okay, the beast is given power to make war with the saints and overcome them, so it's a persecuting power. Also, power over all kindreds, Tongues and nations. And it was this very powerful beast. Has an, uh, basically a global influence and power. It affects people all over the place. Uh, we can see that, I think, still to this day, the Western powers being a nuisance to the entire planet um, and, and being, uh, you know, horrible. And, and frankly, when they call him the great Satan, they're not wrong, right? Because isn't that what... We just read in Revelation 13, <laughs> Satan comes down, occupies those powers, and brings them up. And to this day, we have these sort of unified, loosely unified nations that are very powerful, and people think, who can make war with them? They are the world leaders. And, yeah, they are. Given the power does come from Satan, and those who are, you know, super loyal to this beast, patriots and so on, uh, are worshipping the beast and Satan. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, and who is able to make war with him? And then we continue, the beast is worshipped by all that dwell upon the earth who are not in the book of life. It's an interesting thing that godless patriotism is actually inconsistent with real Christianity. Godless forms of patriotism. There are godly forms of patriotism desiring the best for a nation in the sense of desiring it to to repent of its sins and turn to Christ and and for the people to glorify God and do good and put down weapons of war and and find ways to actually show love and 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 use influence and power for good rather than evil that that's a good form of patriotism but that form of patriotism patriotism is going to make you resist and oppose what currently exists all right um, and so, and then we get to, and despite the beast's boasts and the world's admiration, justice will be served against this beast. And this is the patience and faith and hope of the saints. So here we wrap up. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. And that's how it's going to end. Okay, the, the beast is going down. Um, and here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Why is that the patience and the faith of the saints? Because this beast has been involved in 
various persecutions for centuries, for a long time. Okay, we'll talk about the 1260 days. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it actually is more than possibly more than one application. Okay, and, and so uh, centuries can't apply if it's actually only 1260 24 hour periods. But there is a very strong and compelling reason to believe that there's an, a right interpretation of it as well, uh, where it's a, a day is a year. I'll talk about it. But um, either way, point being, this beast has been a tormentor of Christians, its policies, even to this day, right now. This beast is setting up policies that are putting Christians in a situation where they can't get jobs in some cases because of the uh, bioweapon of the therapy. Okay, and, and so what, what are we getting? We have an enemy here. Uh, a government set systems of set of governments that are out there to harm you, and the patience and the faith of the saints is that which keeps them going. This will end, and there will be justice served, and the enemy that is out to harm us will, in God's providence, be taken out in this way, in a way that fits his crimes. All right. So that is, when we look at all the stuff that's happening in the world and we see all the horrible things, that's necessary to get rid of the beast, to bring down such an established system of godless government and influence over the whole world. And so while it may be hard in some respects and scary in some respects, it's also the thing that should give us encouragement that, you know what? We're close to this ending. The injustice, the immorality, the terrible cruelty, uh, the godless wars, the shedding of blood on all continents, basically. Okay? You, you're, so much uh, is the responsibility of the godless conduct of the governments and the beast system. Okay? These, these, these various political powers. And so this is... Uh, this time we're living in is a difficult time in some respects. It's a little scary, uh, clearly, um, and, and we don't want to diminish uh, the suffering that's happening and will be happening. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is also a necessary step in bringing about a much, much better future and reality. Um, and the people who think they're setting up a new world order, in a sense, they will be setting up a new world order, but it's not the one they wanted. They're going to lose. It's just like when Satan did what? Satan went to kill Christ. And in killing Christ, he actually saved all. No, he didn't you know, give credit to Satan. He didn't try. Okay, In killing Christ, what did he do? He brought about salvation to those who are in Christ. Same thing here. When Satan is right now going to try to take out the existing world order and build a new world order, his world order. But in destroying this world order and trying to establish a new world order, he's going to be stunned when the new world order is a Christian one. Not, he won't be stunned. He, he, he knows what's coming. He can't avoid the inevitable. He knows what Scripture says. But the point is, his act here is self-destructive. What they're doing is destroying themselves. It's going to hurt a lot of people along the way. But they're the ones basically committing suicide. And we end up winning, win Christ. Okay, uh, God takes care of that, and we'll see mass conversions and so on. But we'll get to that stuff as we go. So like, subscribe, share. I think I've said everything I need to say. Um, I guess that beast is... Which beast? The other beast out of the sea is the basically the powers that we see in the world that have... Uh, that came up out of and share some identity with culturally, institutionally, uh, politically, uh, with this uh, post-Roman Empire uh, political situation that came out of Europe. So I would I would include Europe. I would include the countries that are sort of European uh, colonies and uh, things like that, more or less. Especially the most powerful ones. So I, you know, when you look at NATO, I think of NATO basically. So you think of North America and the European powers that are involved in all these wars all the time. 
I, I, I view them as basically being this beast. Um, so, all right, like, subscribe, share. Thanks for watching. And, you know, let me know what you think in the comments. I'm sure there are things I can improve and, and you'll help me along. Blessings.